Hello, so in this video we're going to look at how natural selection works. Uh, now please make sure your phone is off, you've not got the TV on uh, or any games to distract you and you have booklet or pen and paper to take notes. Occasionally you may see this yellow banner appearing, at that point I would like you to pause the video to complete the task. Now please make sure you are ready to begin. And let's start. So we're going to have a bit of a history lesson first. And we're going to learn a little bit about this guy here. Um, this lovely chap here is called Charles Darwin. Um, I mean, check out the beard in there. Absolutely amazing. Um, you can see this statue at the Natural History Museum in London. Well worth a visit. Completely free. Loads of great stuff in there. This guy said called Charles Darwin. Uh, he lived in the 1800s. And he's most famous for going on a, uh, a world tour um, on the HMS Beagle, so a ship that went around the world um, collecting various specimens. And he wrote a book that you might have heard of as well. And when he was uh, out by South America on the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that some of the birds there looked similar to the ones at home. Um, but he noticed there were some differences. Um, I suppose they were a mixture of finches and pigeons. And he noticed that on the Galapagos Islands, on all the different islands, the birds had different beaks depending on what food was available. Um, now he's very, very good at recognising his animals and realised they were all finches, but they all looked very, very different. They had different beaks, they were different colours. And he was a bit confused and he started thinking about it and he worked on his, uh, on his uh, magnus opus and came up with the theory of evolution uh, through means of natural selection uh, and survival of the fittest and we'll have a little look at what all that means. Um, interesting side note as well, he also married his cousin. A um, little bit weird but you know whatever makes him happy. So what is natural selection? So within a species we have variation. Um, so within humans we have different uh, hair colour, eye colour, skin tone, um, body shape, loads and loads of variation. Same with dogs, we can have different uh, dogs. They can be large dogs, small dogs, they can have uh, brown fur, black fur, gold fur, can all be different. We get variation within a species and that is due to our genotype, so what genes we have um, that then represent as a phenotype. Now within a species, certain characteristics will be more successful or desirable whether that is for avoiding prey or for uh, catching prey um, or to look more desirable to the opposite sex. So, for example, uh, deer or the stags for deer have very, very large antlers. The larger the antlers, uh, the more desirable they are to the does. Now, sometimes as well, we can get a mutation. Um, so where one of the genes changes and that can cause a new characteristic to develop. Uh, so for example, a, a bird might have a mutation that causes it to appear, have brighter coloured feathers. Could make it more desirable. Now the individuals within that species that have those characteristics, those successful and desirable characteristics, are more likely to survive and reproduce. You think if you are an animal that is more camouflaged, you are more likely to not be eaten by a predator. If you're not being eaten, you're more likely to survive and be able to have uh, offspring. And you can then pass on those alleles or those genes for those successful characteristics. And they're more likely to be passed on. So your offspring will also have those characteristics. And over time, we'll get more members of that species will inherit those characteristics. Now, this isn't a quick process. It takes hundreds, thousands, millions of years for all these characteristics to pass through, for us to get evolution happening and we get a new species. So this time that we're talking about here uh, is millions of years. It's a very long time. Evolution is not a quick process. We're now going to have a look at some natural selection in action. Um, I'm going to talk through a few of them first, and then you're going to have a go at doing one yourself. Um, if you've got the booklets, 
they are exactly the same as the ones in the well, not exact same, but it's the same principle as the ones in the booklets. You'll work through it and go, oh, OK, this is what's going on. This is why it's more successful or desirable. So we're going to have a look first at a very, very classic example. Um, and this actually did happen fairly quickly. Um, this is the peppered moth. Um, you can see on here we've got a very light coloured one. We also have a dark coloured one here as well that is harder to see. And these are the same species. They are just different colours. We've got the light one we've got here and we've got the dark one we've got here. Now before the Industrial Revolution, the light coloured moth was more common. The moths like to hide on trees. Before the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of lichen on the trees and the bark was often very, very light. Therefore, the light coloured moth was a lot more camouflaged and harder to see for any predators. Because it wasn't seen, it wasn't eaten, more likely to reproduce and pass on those genes for the light colour. The dark coloured moth stood out, um, more likely to be seen, more likely to be eaten and less likely to reproduce. There were still some reproducing, obviously, but not as many. The Industrial Revolution then hits. As a country, we are churning out loads and loads of uh, smog and smoke. It starts to kill a lot of the lichen on the trees. It also turns the bark a little bit darker and suddenly as you can see now, this light coloured moth is now sticking out. It can be seen and the dark coloured moth is now camouflaged. Now, this is now a desirable characteristic. This is the one that is getting passed on. So the dark coloured moth is more camouflaged, uh, is more likely to survive and pass on that dark coloured allele. Uh, remembering that an allele is a version of a gene. So the gene in this case is uh, the gene for the colour. Have the two alleles are for the light colour or the dark colour. The dark coloured one is more likely to be successful and pass on that gene. We're going to have a look at another one now. We're going to have a look at Darwin's finches. So we've got the images of them here. We've got four different finches here. They're all finches. But you can agree they all look very, very different. You might even think they're completely different, but they are all finches. Now, these all come from a similar area, um, they're all in the Galapagos Islands, but they're all on different islands. And that gives us a clue as to why they might look slightly different. Now, the food available on each island basically determines the beak that the finch will have. So we can't, you can look at the colour as well if we want to. We're not going to for the moment, though. So the food that is available determines the beak that the finch will have. So the finch with the long thin beak, so this one here, is more successful in getting insects out of trees. So it wants to eat insects and it gets them out of trees. Uh, our finch with our larger beak, so we'll look at this one here, is more successful in cracking the nuts of certain trees to get the food in there. This one here wouldn't be very good at getting the nuts at all. Uh, because this beak is very, very long and thin, not great for cracking nuts. This one, great for cracking nuts, not good for catching insects out of trees. So at one point, we assumed that actually these finches were all looked pretty much the same. But on one of the islands where there were no nuts available and there were more insects in trees, any finch that had a longer beak would have been more successful. They'd have got more food. They'd have been more likely to survive and reproduce. They would have passed that gene on. Any finch with a larger beak wouldn't have been able to get those insects out of the tree, wouldn't have survived and wouldn't pass those genes on. There still would have been some food for them to eat. They would have got some food that would just died out overnight. But over time, I'm talking a very long time, we would have seen all the finches ending up looking like this. Now see on a neighboring island, where there were more nuts available. The bird here with the larger beak was more likely to survive, more likely to be able to get the nuts and break them and eat what was inside. It was more successful, so it was more likely to survive and pass on those genes. Again, we're going to say it is a very 
long and slow process. Evolution is not quick. We can very, very rarely see it happening. It happens over thousands or millions of years. So you're now going to have a go yourself at doing one. We've got here, we've got something called the Mandarin Ducks. Uh, they came from China and they now live uh, all over the world. There's now more breeding pairs in the UK than there are in China. Now the male, the drake, is very, very brightly coloured. So our male, this one here. Our female is dull coloured, is this one here. I'd like you now to pause the video and say, and tell me why do the male and female ducks look so different? So we're thinking about that natural selection. Pause the video, answer the question. When you are ready, you can press play again. Fantastic, so hopefully you've had a think about why they are different. So the drake, the male duck, are brightly coloured to attract females. Um, it's a, a showing off display. And the more brightly coloured the drake is, the more likely it is to get the female and be able to reproduce and pass on their genes. But their offspring are also more likely to be brightly coloured. The most brightly coloured their offspring will also be more likely to reproduce and pass on their genes. And gradually we get brighter and brighter. Now obviously if they get too bright, or the feathers get too big, they're going to be more obvious to predators, so more likely to be eaten. So they're trying to reach that level where it's exactly right. They've got the right amount of camouflage, but also the right amount of bright colours and large feathers to attract the females. Now the ducks, or the females, are dull coloured. At one point, chances are they would have all been either all dull coloured or all brightly coloured. But actually the duller the colour of the female, the more camouflage they are while sitting on their nest. They've laid their eggs, they're sitting on the nest. They don't want to be seen by predators. They want to keep their eggs warm and safe. They're brightly coloured or they're visible. They're more likely to be seen by predators and either they will be eaten or their eggs will be eaten. Therefore, the ducks that have the best camouflage are less likely to be seen and eaten by those predators. So we'll pass on those genes for the dull colour to their female offspring. And we can see that these ducks have evolved over millions of years for the drakes to become very brightly coloured and the hens or the ducks to be very, very dull coloured. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye bye.